Well, hello everyone and welcome once again to the Generations Bible Study coming to you from St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky. My name is Ken Jobst and we have been engaged in a lengthy study of the gospel according to St. Mark. Today we're going to be taking a look at Mark chapter 14 verses 53 through 72. So let's dive right into it. This is the account of uh, after Jesus has been arrested, this is the account of Jesus' trial before the Sanhedrin. So from verse 53, and we'll take it all the way down to verse 65. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all of the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood up and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another, not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus. And you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his robes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. So we'll stop right there at the end of verse 65. This is truly, truly a, a, a remarkable and shameful passage of Scripture as we see Jesus before the Sanhedrin. We begin in verse 53 with what we might call the gathering. Right? This is the, the gathering of the high priest and the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law. Um, and, and I want this to not escape our attention. All of these people, the high priests, the chief priests, the elders, the teachers of the law, they're supposed to be in the business of life. But they have conspired together, these religious officials, to be about treachery and death. Now, Verse 54, Peter followed him at a distance. Now, right there, you know something's wrong. Jesus called those that he called to follow him. And here, Peter is following him but following him at a distance. And I've got to ask the question, how much distance is too much distance? When we're called to follow Jesus, we're called to follow Jesus as closely as we possibly can. If we decide to follow Jesus at a distance, as Peter does, we'll find that there's all kinds of trouble awaiting us when we, when we take that tack. Oh, I'll follow Jesus, but only at a distance. I don't want to be too closely identified with Jesus, which was precisely Peter's 
problem. He did not want to be associated with Jesus. Now, watch this. Let me read this again. Verse 54, Peter followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Sometimes it's difficult to tell the difference between profound bravery and profound stupidity. I'm just saying. Here's Peter. He's followed Jesus at a distance. So Jesus arrives in the, the courtyard of the high priest and is actually taken into the dungeon, taken into the lower level of the, uh, the, the high priest's house. But Peter follows, follows at a distance, and arrives in the courtyard of the high priest. Now, he's... Would you think that's a dangerous place to be if you're wanting to not be associated with Jesus and they just bring him into the... the high priest's house, right? Here's Peter. He's in the courtyard of the high priest. And what else? He's sitting with the guards. Now that takes some chutzpah right there to, to sit with the guards in the courtyard of the high priest. And watch this. Not only is he sitting with the guards in the courtyard of the high priest, but he is warming himself at the fire. Now, the Greek New Testament, right, the, the, the original language that Mark wrote in, tells us something very interesting. Uh, it doesn't say that he sat at the fire. It says in the Greek that he sat at the light at the phos, which, which, okay, it's nighttime, right? It's nighttime. He enters into the courtyard of the high priest. He sits down next to the guards. He sits down next to the guards in the light. He's, he's, he's sitting at the fire. So anybody walking by could recognize him. No, you're not, uh-uh. You're not following me here, right? What was he doing just a little while ago? He had his sword out and he's cutting off the, the ear of the high priest's servant. Dude, don't, you know, it, that, that's back in Gethsemane. And now he's walked a quarter mile. People don't let that stuff go just because you walked a quarter mile away from where it happened. Now, of course, G Jesus restores the ear of the, the high priest's servant, but still, I, you got to imagine that some people were still a little testy around that whole episode. But here's Peter, big as life, walks, you know, he's following Jesus, but at a distance, and he goes right up into the courtyard of the high priest. He sits down next to the guards, right? Oh, oh, wait a minute, who's guards? The high priest guards. Get out. The high priest guards, who just a little while previously, right? Mm. <sighs> Peter voluntarily, wisely or not, has just put himself in an incredibly dangerous situation. I've got to ask the question, why would somebody do that? Why would they do that? Unless Peter is thinking there's going to be a revolution and I want to be at the heart of it. There's, there's going to be something big go down and I have to be where Jesus is. I, I have to be at the heart of whatever coup attempt what, whatever revolution, whatever's going to go down, Peter's feeling like he has to be at the center of it. And let me tell you, in the courtyard of the high priest, you're at the center of it. Okay. Verse 55. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking 
for evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death. Get out! The Sanhedrin is looking for evidence, which means it's going to be made up evidence, right? It, it, they're going to find what they're looking for. So the Sanhedrin is looking for evidence against Jesus so they can put him to death. Now I've got to tell you what, hold the phone here a minute, right? The Sanhedrin is the Supreme Court of Israel, right? The Supreme Court is not, think of America's Supreme Court. The American Supreme Court is not designed to go out and look for evidence so they can put somebody to death. No, that's not what the Supreme, Supreme Court does, right? The Supreme Court and the Sanhedrin, you know, the Sanhedrin was to evaluate the evidence that was brought to it. They were not supposed to go out and try to fabricate evidence, right? With, with a foregone conclusion that we're going to find, we have to find the evidence in order for us to be able to convict this person of a capital crime and put him to death. That's not how justice works. No, no, no. And, and by the way, look, look at America. The Supreme Court does not investigate cases. The Supreme Court hears the evidence that is presented as a result of an investigation. They don't, they're not the one going out investigating, trying to find fingerprints and crime scenes and yada, yada, yada. You know, police are going to go do that. The Sanhedrin is supposed to impartially sit back and with cool demeanor consider the evidence that's brought before it. But no, this Sanhedrin is particularly looking for evidence that will support a foregone conclusion of a death sentence and a death verdict. So, Chief priests, they're looking for evidence. They find some people who are going to give false testimony, but watch. Oh, they give the false testimony. Oh, but their statements didn't agree, right? You have to establish everything on the testimony of two or three witnesses. They found the people who would hype up a charge against Jesus, but they all stuck to their own stories and they, they wouldn't come together. So, so there's, there's no agreement among the shady stories. Then verse 57, some stood up and gave false testimony against him. We heard him say, I'll destroy this temple built with human hands and in three days build another not made with hands. But even then, there, the, the testimony itself did not agree, right? So this, this is getting to, be, come on, it's late at night. It's probably like one in the morning, two in the morning, three in the morning. The high priest wants to get to bed. The high priest, you know, well, the high priest needs some rest, but he really wants to be able to put Jesus to death. So he's staying up. He's cranky. And when he can't get the false testifiers to agree on their false testimony, you've got to see the scene here. The the. The chief priest is ready to go nuts. He's just ready to go crazy. And verse 60, then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, right? The, the high priest is going to cut through the red tape here and just get to the, the meat of the situation. High priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? Right? So, so here's the deal. These dumb schlubs that I've brought in to testify false testimony against you, they can't get their act together to the degree that they can give a coherent statement and two of them agree on it so we can go ahead with the proceedings. So the, the high priest, ready to pull out his hair, just directly asked Jesus, are you not going to answer? What's the test? What's this testimony? Why are these guys so messed up in their testimony that they're trying to bring against you? Do you see the utter frustration 
and the utter ridiculousness of what the high priest is doing here. The high priest is turning to the person that he's trying to execute, trying to have a capital case verdict against this man, and he's, he's saying, are you not going to answer? What's this testimony these people are bringing against you? Now, now watch. Look. In America, we've got what's called the Fifth Amendment, right? Which means that you need not give testimony which would incriminate yourself. Now, please understand, the Fifth Amendment didn't just appear out of the ether, right? The Fifth Amendment comes from a history of jurisprudence that is, is underscoring this particular fact. You don't make the accused testify against themselves, by the way, or, or their wife, because they're seen as one flesh. That would be testifying against yourself. So the high priest, are you not going to answer? What's this testimony these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Good for you, Jesus, right? That you're exactly the kind of client that most attorneys would want to have. You're not going to, to spill a whole bunch of beans here because you're not required to. Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, watch, now the high priest is going to ask a different question. Again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? And here, Jesus answers. And he says, ego eimi, which is Greek for I am, said Jesus. And you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Now, wait a minute. I, I, I want us to really understand what Jesus is saying here. I am, by the way, in the Gospel of John, there are the, the repeated I am statements of Jesus. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, right? The, 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 the I am the good shepherd, I am the door of the sheep, all of those I am statements of Jesus, which remind us of how Jehovah, how God, the Heavenly Father, described himself to Moses, I am that I am, right? So, so this, this is all along that line. I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One. Now, where does that happen? That happens in heaven, right? Coming on the clouds of heaven. That is, you'll see Jesus come again. Now, when does that happen? When does that happen? It happens after the death sentence is carried out on Jesus. So Jesus is telling the high priest, yes, I am the Messiah. Yes, I am the son of the blessed one. And beyond that, after you kill me, you'll see me seated at the right hand of the father, coming on the clouds with, with, with power and you know, all majesty. The high priest tore his clothes. What do we need? Why do we need any more witnesses? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? Now, <laughs> this is, this just blows me away. This, so the high priest tears his clothes, tears his robe which he is supposed to do when he hears blasphemy. When he hears blasphemy, it turns out Jesus is telling the truth. So it is not blasphemy. He's tore his clothes, but he says this. We don't need any more stinking witnesses. You know, we, we don't need any more witnesses. You've heard the blasphemy, and he's speaking to the Sanhedrin. He says, what do you think? You've heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. I want to say something about that right there. They all condemned him as worthy of death. Now, 
there's a whole big long laundry list of procedural errors, of miscarriages of justice, of um, irregularities in the trial of Jesus. And right here is one of them. I, I've got a big list of them, right? But right here is one of them. And it's this, that the Sanhedrin's rule was if there is a unanimous vote on a capital crime, then the proceedings had to stop and a new vote needed to be taken. If absolutely everybody that was, was present, if, if, if all 71, if everybody was there, by the way, that's another thing. Were all 71 of the Sanhedrin present at this juncture? Were, were they present here? I would argue no, all 71 were not. I would argue that there was a quorum of the 71. And the quorum could have been as small as one-third for them to have done business. But re remember, like Joseph of Arimathea, re remember Nicodemus, you know, these are, are people who would have been a part of the Sanhedrin, but may not have been present at this particular time. But the Sanhedrin would have gone ahead with their business. Now, now here, here's the rub. As I said, in any case which was a capital case in which the Sanhedrin voted unanimously for, to convict someone of a capital case, which meant that person would be executed, whenever that happened, the Sanhedrin was to stop its proceedings and take a step back and reconsider because for all 71 to vote to condemn a person to death meant that there was no mercy expressed by the Sanhedrin and that justice was to be tempered with mercy. And so in the occasion where everybody votes for death, it was to automatically trigger an internal appeal at which the next vote you would have expected at least somebody to say, well, now, you know, no, I'm, I'm going to express mercy upon this person. Now, once again, the majority vote would rule, but let it be noted that there was at least one or two of the Sanhedrin members that, that expressed mercy. That was seen as a necessary element of the judicial process. But here, they all condemned him worthy of death. Now, we're talking about procedural irregularities. We're talking about the unjust or the unjust trial of Jesus. Watch this. Then some began to spit at him. What? They blindfolded him. No, no, no wait, this is after they're, you know, pronouncing him guilty. They blindfold him, strike him with their fists, and say, prophesy. And the guards took him and beat him. So they're mocking the convicted prisoner. They're, they're mocking him. They're spitting on him. The Sanhedrin. Now, can you imagine? Can you imagine in your wildest dreams the Supreme Court of the United States where the justices, upon finding somebody guilty or determining somebody to, to be culpable for a particular crime. Can you imagine a situation where they're in their judicial robes as they are seated at the bench that they stand up and spit on the person that they just pronounced guilty? Can you imagine that the Supreme Court, can, can you, and I'm just saying, back in the day, could you imagine Ruth Bader Ginsburg getting up and slapping somebody hitting them after they've just been, you know, found guilty or whatever. They spit at him. They blindfolded him. They struck him with their fist. They mocked him, saying, prophesy. And the guards took him out and beat him. Okay. I got to say something here. Um, yeah, the Sanhedrin went crazy. They just went 
crazy. I'm sure somebody can give a better catalog than I can, but I, I want to add to these two episodes eight more instances of illegalities, procedural malfunctions in the trial of Jesus. And, and you know, uh, this, this list will add up to 10 when you, add, you know, consider, you know, there was no mercy shown, number one. There, the, the justices berated and mocked and spit at and, and struck and blindfolded the, the prisoner. Add to that, watch this, there were not supposed to be any trials during Passover anyway. Right? It, 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 there's not supposed to be any trials during any of the feasts. Next, you know, the Sanhedrin was supposed to vote by individual votes, not by acclamation. You you were supposed to go have a roll call vote, okay? You know, uh, Nicodemus, what do you say? Okay, Joseph of Arimathea, what do you say? It was supposed to be a roll call vote, not a voice of acclamation. And you know what? For a death penalty case, which is what they just did here, there's supposed to be one day that passes between the sentencing and the carrying out of the sentence. That doesn't happen. By the way, from a greater perspective, the Jews lacked the authority to execute anybody anyway. That was supposed to be a Roman thing. Once again, there was supposed to be no trial at night. That was just an indication of a, a kangaroo court, right? If somebody was going to hold a trial at night, that told you from the from jump that it's going to be some kind of shady thing. The Sanhedrin was not supposed to meet at night. Do you ever wonder who Jesus' lawyer was? Right, gotcha. Jesus was not afforded a lawyer. The Sanhedrin was supposed to allow for the accused to have counsel or representation at any time. That was completely set aside in the case of Jesus. By the way, we've already mentioned this, that Sanhedrin had no, no right to ask Jesus a self-incriminating question. Um, and, you know, just overall, the Sanhedrin was not supposed to initiate charges. They were supposed to adjudicate the case, but they were not supposed to be the ones that went out to initiate a charge. They're saying, we want to find this person guilty. Well, you know, go find a prosecuting attorney to take care of that for you. Don't, you know, so, so there, there's 10, there's probably 12, there's probably 100 different uh, points of law which are violated to be able to get to the point where Jesus is condemned to death. Let's continue in verse 66, verse 66 through 72. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were present. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. Hmm. Verse 69. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, this fellow's one of them. Again, he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses and swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately, the rooster crowed a second time. Then Peter remembered the word Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and 
wept. Oh my goodness. Here's Peter. Brave Peter, who followed Jesus at a distance into the courtyard of the high priest, sat down next to the guard, had his face right up next to the light so everybody could see him. And what happens? The servant girl. Hmm. You know, um, the servant girl set Peter on the run. He, he was sitting next to the fire. The servant girl says, wait a minute, aren't you with the Nazarene out here? I thought I saw you with him. Peter retreats from sitting next to the fire. He retreats from the fire to go out by the entryway. He can't wait to get away from this servant girl. The servant girl tells the bystanders, the bystanders correctly identify Peter as a Galilean and as an associate of Jesus, and then Peter denies Christ once, twice, three times, and then the rooster crows for the second time. By the way, the, the, the time of the rooster crowing was typically between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. You know, there's always going to be some rooster in town that gets up at 4 and starts, you know, uh, starts crowing at 4 o'clock in the morning. The, the second rooster crow may well have been, and, and by the way, th this was the vernacular, this is the way it was referred to back in the day, um, that second rooster crow may have been actually the trumpet call of Reveille for the Roman army. That, you know, that there would be, they didn't have exactly what you would call a bugle, but that they, they would have a trumpet call to awaken the garrison. And that was called the cox crow. So the cox crow was typically like 5.30 in the morning. You would get, you know, you would hear the Roman equivalent of the army bugle call reveille to, to awaken the troops. So Peter hears it and he's devastated. Says he broke down and wept. And, and, and this, this word for wept doesn't mean, you know, dab a couple of tears. It means that he was ugly crying with snot and everything else going on. He was absolutely despondent. Now, he's brave enough to enter into the courtyard of the high priest. But upon finding out, you know, his own cowardice in denying Jesus three times and basically, you know, denying Jesus to a servant girl. Um, yipes, yipes. And those denials, you know, there's a sense in which the denials are similar. There's a sense in which the denials are different. You know, he, he, he denies being an associate of Jesus to the servant girl. That's one thing. But, but then there's other people. And when there's other people that caught wind of what the servant girl was, was talking about, you know, Peter denies Jesus to them as well. Uh, so, wow. So here's Peter. And he's devastated. He's weeping. Why is he weeping? He's weeping because he realizes his failure. And he realizes the depth of his failure. Have you ever felt that your failures made it impossible for Christ to use you again, right? That's where Peter is. Now, it's important for me to say that's not the end of the story. Peter's denial is not the end of the story because Peter is going to get restored. As a matter of fact, please bear in mind the words that we are reading are Peter's account of the events recorded by John Mark. So the very fact that we can read the Gospel of Mark is testimony to us, to a degree, it's testimony to us of the restoration that Peter experienced. And John goes into more detail about what that restoration actually looked like. You know, feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs, uh, as, as Jesus told Peter. And also, remember, you know, uh, 
in the post-resurrection appearances of Jesus. He says, I'm going to the Galilee, go, go tell, tell the others, and Peter. You know, he makes a point to, uh, to tell Peter about the resurrection. Well, that, this actually concludes chapter 14, and I know it's a long chapter, it's 76 verses or so, but, uh, you know, it, so much is going into that, and we're seeing here the illegal and immoral trial of Jesus. And once again, we're seeing in juxtaposition, Jesus and Peter. They're, they're both in this thing as they progress through. Let's have a word of prayer together as we uh, conclude this lesson. Lord, we thank you for your, your love that never fails. We thank you for the, the resoluteness of your spirit, uh, even in approaching Gal in, excuse me, in approaching Calvary and uh, the cross. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness and your mercy that over overwhelms the, the goodness and mercy that was supposed to be there for you in the justice that would have been administered by the Sanhedrin. Lord, we know that you are the God of justice. And so we pray for your grace and mercy to be with us this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, once again, from St. Stephen Church in Louisville, Kentucky, this has been Ken Jobst with the Generations Bible Study. We will continue this study next time, and I hope to see you then. Take good care. God bless you. Bye-bye.